The Zeitgeist Movement Defined, Part 3, A New Train of Thought, Introduction to Sustainable Thought. Quote, Action is the product of the qualities inherent in nature. It is only the ignorant man who misled by personal egotism says, I am the doer. End quote. The Bhagavad Gita. Socioeconomic Spectrum. As alluded to in prior essays, sustainable practices can only come about by a value reorientation towards sustainable thought. While the notion of sustainability is often reduced to an ecological context, the real issue under the surface is cultural. This hence becomes a process of education. It is the perspective of the zeitgeist movement that the economic system utilized in a society is the greatest influence on the values and beliefs of its people. For instance, deeply rooted in, even in the seemingly separate politico-religious doctrines of our time resides an undercurrent of values set forth by economic assumptions. The term socioeconomic, which is the social science that links the effects of economic activity to other social processes, could have its meaning more specifically extended to also include religious views, political biases, military initiatives, tribal loyalties, cultural customs, legal statutes, and other common societal phenomena. It appears that the very fabric of our lives, and hence our value system, is born most dominantly from the cultural perception of our survival, social relationships, and ideas of personal social success. Moreover, it is critical to restate that political systems, which most in the world still seem to be awarding priority of importance when it comes to the state of affairs in society, are at best secondary in relevance, if not in fact entirely obsolete, when the true ramifications of the economic structure are factored in. In fact, as will be argued in future essays, political governance as we know it is really nothing more than an outgrowth of economic inefficiency. Very few would care much about who was in power or other such traditional notions if they clearly understood the process of economic unfolding and were able to contribute and gain without conflict. Therefore, there is no greater issue of importance than the system of economic unfolding when it comes to the conduct and stability of human beings on both the personal and social level. Ephemeralization. Generally speaking, an economic system exists to meet the needs and wants of the population. The degree by which it is able to do so depends on the state of usable resources and the technical strategy utilized to harness those resources for a given purpose. In this context, notable engineer and thinker R. Buckminster Fuller argued that true economic wealth is not money or even the material outcome of a given production. Rather, true wealth is the level of energy production, efficiency enabled, coupled with knowledge development that furthers the intelligent management of the Earth's resources. In this view, he defined and expressed a trend termed ephemeralization, which tracks humanity's technical ability to increasingly do more with less. Historically speaking, ephemeralization is, in gesture, a contradiction of the still deeply held Malthusian consideration, which in part claims that humanity is forever out of balance with nature and there will always be a section of the population that must suffer as the available resources simply do not add up to meet everyone's needs. As noted in prior essays, this worldview is ever apparent in the economic system we still embrace today, globally forging deep structural biases that have inevitably favored one class of people over another in survival advantage. In other words, a war game has culminated, built out of the assumption of universal, perpetually reinforced scarcity, which moves forward today on its own momentum, largely absent of its original causal reasoning. 
the vast majority of what we define as corruption today, more often than not, finds its psychological root in this competitive awareness both on the personal level, the corporate business level, and on the level of government in the form of war, tyranny, and self-preserving collusion. In fact, it can be well argued that the very notion of ethical in a world decidedly working to gain at the expense of others becomes a highly relative and almost arbitrary distinction. Yet this trend of ephemeralization having increased rapidly from the 20th century's almost sudden industrial scientific advancements deeply challenges this protectionist, elitist, scarcity-driven worldview suggesting new paradigm-shifting possibilities for human organization. These possibilities, in part, statistically reveal that we are now able to take care of the entire world's population at a standard of living unknown to the vast majority of humanity today. However, in order for this new reality of efficiency to be harnessed, the archaic barriers ingrained in our everyday way of life, specifically our perception of economics, need to be reevaluated and likely overcome entirely. <clears throat> as noted in prior essays, the term utopia commonly arises as a pejorative term amongst those who tend to dismiss large-scale social improvement due to either a cynicism of so-called human nature or an outright disbelief in humanity's technical capacity to now adjust greatly with new technical means. For example, an objection common to the current culture, specifically the wealthy, first world nations, rests in the value of what could be termed the violence of mass acquisition. At its root, this view takes the Malthusian concept of need-oriented resource insufficiency and transposes it to assume a pressure of acquisitive irrationality. In other words, it assumes human beings empirically have infinite material wants and even if, say, every human being could exist with what the West today would deem an upper-class lifestyle, with no one falling short, an element of our psychology would never be satisfied in the material sense, and the interest in more and more material gain would thus always create a destabilizing imbalance in society. Therefore, the existence of haves and have-nots is perceived to be a consequence of our inherent status-driven psychology and greed, not availability of resources and means. <clears throat> to the extent that this is actually true is dubious at best given the extreme cultural condition we find ourselves in today, compared with the historical fact that outside of Western, aka capitalistic, influence, the concept of vain material success is far from universal for the human being. In truth, the relationship of success and property has been culturally manufactured based upon system necessity and is now a staple value of our consumer-based society. In a world now driven by economic growth to keep employment at a reasonable level, in a world which overtly praises those with great financial wealth as a measure of success, in a world that actually rewards behaviors of human indifference and ruthless competition for market share rather than honest social contribution for overall human betterment, it is no mystery as to why the idea of a single human owning, say, a 400-room mansion on 500,000 acres of private land with 50 cars and five planes parked in the front yard has become part of an ideal, coveted vision of personal and social success. Yet, from the perspective of true human sustainability, this view is pure violence and exists in nearly the same category of one who hoards food and resources he or she doesn't need and refuses to allow others access for the sake of abstract principle. If we imagine a small island of ten people, where two people decide to extract and hoard one thousand more than they need, to be healthy, leaving eight people to live in abject poverty and or dying, would you find this arrangement an act of personal freedom by those two or an act of social violence against the eight? 
This is brought up here to dismiss the utopian abundance fallacy reaction common to many regarding, in part, the implications of ephemeralization. Just as we as a global society are realizing the inherent physical limitations of our industrial behaviors, slowly adjusting away from ecologically destabilizing consequences, the understanding that an infinite wants-based value orientation is equally as detrimental to social balance is critical to realize. System Limitation When it comes to cultural philosophies, the human population must gain, in part, a clear understanding of its limitations and derive its expectations and values from this physical reality. The limitations imposed by our environment exist irrespective of human values, interests, wants, or even needs in abstraction. If we were to remove humanity from planet Earth and observe the Earth's natural ecological operations with the causal scientific understandings we have today, we would witness a synergistic symbiotic system governed by the universal dynamics of nature. Hence, no matter what we think about ourselves, our intentions, or our freedoms, once we are placed into this system of physical law, we are bound to it, regardless of our beliefs or the cultural norms we have taken for granted, or which have been imposed as inevitable or immutable by our various cultures. If we choose to learn and align with the logic inherent, we find sustainability and hence stability. If we choose to ignore or fight these pre-existing rules, we will inevitably decrease stability and problems will arise, as is the near constant state of affairs today in the early 21st century. This awareness of natural limitations as we have come to understand them today via the scientific method expresses perhaps the most profound shift in human loyalties in history. In short, we now understand that we either align with the natural world or we suffer. Sadly, this firm referential association still stands at odds with many common philosophies today, such as established religious and political perspectives. Remarkably also, it is a common rejoinder to label this very firmly based realization as totalitarian or black and white. A seemingly rigid and arbitrary imposition upon human life, rather than simply the undeniable, scientifically demonstrable state of affairs. Intriguingly, the nearly paradoxical punchline of the whole consideration of natural law is that within this rational box of system limitation we define as the governing laws of nature, our range of possibility within these boundaries, via the scientific method, also reveals an ever-increasing technical efficiency and incredible potential to create an abundance to meet human needs globally. Furthermore, since humanity is the only species on Earth with the mental capacity to alter or affect its ecosystem in truly profound ways, this necessity for alignment becomes critical for species sustainability, public health, and true problem-solving advancement. Nothing could be more dangerous than a world culture that, given the exponential increase in our capacity to affect ecological and social balance with technology, misunderstands its power and effects. In many ways, humanity is faced with an educational race against time with respect to its current immaturity in handling the incredible newfound powers it has realized via science and technology. As an aside, it is important to remember that when it comes to the history of economic thought itself, the frame of reference has had more to do with assumptions of human behavior than intelligent resource management and general physical science or natural law understandings. While our most innate behavioral reflexes and genetic propensities are certainly relevant to the consequences of a socioeconomic system and are very much a part of the equation, assumptions of human behavior cannot rationally be held as a structural starting point of an economic system. Humans are a consequence of the same ecological system, conditions, and not the other way around. So, in conclusion to this introduction, if the purpose of a social system is to create an ever-increasing standard of living, 
while also maintaining environmental and social balance to assure we do not reduce this quality in the future due to possible resulting consequences of irresponsible choices such as resource depletion, pollution, disease, negative stress, wealth imbalance, and other issues. It then becomes critical to base our methodology on the most relevant set of technical parameters we can, oriented around the current state of scientific awareness on both an ecological and human level.